everyone. Recording in progress. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. If you're just joining us, please make sure you're on mute um, as we get going here so we don't get that little feedback noise. Anyway, my name is Roberta McIntyre. I am with FireSafe Sonoma, and I was a career firefighter for many years and was the county fire marshal for a few years and currently am the present CEO of FireSafe Sonoma. And FireSafe Sonoma has been working for a number of years now with the Sonoma Ecology Center, the Habitat Corridor Project, the uh, Master Gardener Program, and the uh, Sonoma Ecology Center. Did I say that already? Anyway, so those folks there, the, all of us got together to form what we call the Resilient Landscape Coalition. So this presentation is brought to you by that Resilient Landscape uh, Coalition. And when we were putting together these modules, one of the things that I, I think I brought to the group as a, not a plant person, but a firefighter, is I, I wanted to come up with a way to teach firefighters when they're doing uh, defensible space inspections, how to help folks understand that you can create a beautiful landscape and still at the same time make it fire safe. Um, and so that's kind of what this is about. This is just to whet your appetite a little bit. It's 30 minutes followed by a Q&A. So we're not going to get into the weeds, so to speak, with a lot of stuff. But um, we, we are going to do kind of a really good overview, overview for you guys. Hopefully you guys will take some steps further and learn more about this because I think it's really key. We don't want moonscapes out there. Um, we want beautiful landscapes, but we want them to be fire safe also. So um, can you stop screen share for a moment, John, and I'll introduce the rest of the team real fast. So with us today is my dog in the background, uh, Ellie Inslee uh, from the Sonoma Ecology Center, uh, John Cagney from the Sonoma Ecology Center, April Owens from the Habitat Corridor Project, uh, Paul, Paul Lowenthal with uh, Santa Rosa Fire Department. He was kind of like the link between the Resilient Landscape Coalition and you all to get this in front of you. So thanks, Chief Lowenthal, for making that happen. So with that, um, I Paul, did you want to say a few things before we hand it off to John to, to run the show? Yeah, no, just real quick, uh, uh, Paul Lowenthal, for those that haven't met uh, with San Rosa Fire and then also a board member with Fire Safe Sonoma and uh, happy that we're able to uh, connect the people that are here today to present with our fire prevention officers group um, and provide some valuable training. Uh, thank you, Ellie and John and April for all the work uh, that went into putting this quick little presentation together for us and we're appreciative of it. Uh, I know there was also discussion about potentially putting on another one for our group uh, in the future. So uh, look forward to that opportunity and with for any other staff from any of our agencies that weren't able to hop on today or might want to take it again. So thank you again and uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Chief Flo. And a couple of real quick housekeeping things. So if you have questions, write them down as soon as you think of them, put them in the chat. And then after the presentation, we'll, we'll run through the questions and try to get to them all. Um, so, John, I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let me just get a couple of things set up here again. And full screen. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, uh, as described, my name is John Kennegy. I'm super happy to be with you this afternoon. I'm designing an implementation project manager with Sonoma Ecology Center, and I'm a partner with the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. Uh, which, with funding from Sonoma County, provides education and outreach to homeowners and landscape designers and contractors, and also def defensible space inspectors. And I'm very pleased to be with you all um, this afternoon. The presentation is for defensible space inspectors and has been designed not so much to review the defensible space guidelines, which I know that you're very comfortable with, but to explore opportunities that are presented by the need to sort of reassess landscapes through a, a lens of wildfire uh, protection. So lots of examples are going to be given. Uh, we'll have lots of time for, or we'll have some time for questions and, and discussion at the end. And I definitely wanna say that I come from a philosophy of that we are all teachers here. We all have things to learn here. So during the discussion, we'll share um, experiences and observations that we've had and, and I'll come out of this in a little bit, uh, uh, in a better, uh, a more informed position. Um, again, um, a partner in the Resilient Landscapes Coalition uh, which is a partnership that formed a few years ago. It's made up of 
Fire Safe Sonoma, and uh, you know, he just met Roberta. If you didn't know her before, April Owens, is, as, uh, as has been said, is with us uh, here as well this afternoon from the Habitat Corridor Project. And that's great, actually, because a lot of the, she has a longer, has had a longer uh, career in landscape design than I have. And, um, and many of the examples that I'll show are from gardens that she's designed and, and helps to install. From the Sonoma Ecology Center, um, I come, but also Ellie Inslee is here and will participate in the panel and discussion. She is uh, one of the founding members of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, a landscape architect and restoration specialist uh, that is on the board of directors for SEC. And then also the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County is a partner in the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. We also have worked closely with County of Sonoma Fire Prevention Division, Cal Fire and local fire departments in preparing our, our workshops and our information. Um, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition was created to help landowners understand the current defensible space guidelines, and often folks are confronted with the need to remove plants to make their landscape more fire wise. We also want to help them understand the opportunities uh, to create habitat now and to nudge their landscape towards one that's better adapted to our climate as we have you know, some serious issues with, with water, with energy, uh, with climate, and we can, we can do some things in our landscapes that, um, you know, that work towards solutions for those problems. Uh, this particular image shows a landscape that is adequately irrigated. It has some space around the base of the tree, some vertical space between the, uh, the native coral bells uh, or hookara here and the, the, um, the, the canopy of a live oak tree uh, above it. So we're, we, we want to emphasize that with some careful selection, placement and, ma and maintenance of the plants and other materials, we can have these dual benefits of biodiversity, of habitat, and of beauty. Uh, a quick outline uh, for the presentation. I'll very briefly discuss uh, defensible space ecology and some sustainability um, uh, goals for a landscape. Uh, again, be brief about design and maintenance principles is because I know you're familiar with those and spend as much time as possible on planting and maintenance examples. During the course of the presentation, uh, I'll try to dispel some myths and answer some questions about like, how do we avoid creating a moonscape? Uh, do we have to cut down all the trees or the best fire resistant plants? And we'll get to those all very shortly here in turn. Uh, ecology and sustainability, we can benefit from uh, a number of services in our own home landscape uh, or in the defensible space around ecology. Things like biodiversity can be enhanced. We can improve the soil and help to hold it in place. Uh, we can clean and manage stormwater that falls on the property uh, and try to keep it on the property rather than sending it out into the street into the nearest uh, drop inlet and creek. Uh, sequestering carbon is important. So, uh, supporting pollinators has been, been critically important in recent years. Um, so inspectors may be able to encourage enhancing gardens for biodiversity uh, while encouraging the certain plants need to come out just based on their uh, where they were originally placed in the, in the landscape. Uh, this map shows where um, biodiversity is most impaired in, in our country. And you can see that California really lights up the brighter red Areas are those that are in greater peril of losing species. Uh, and this largely comes from um, development of lands, loss of wild lands uh, can also come from pesticide use and other um, you know, uh, products of our sort of industrialized uh, civilization. Uh, so we need to make up for this loss of habitat in our designed and built landscapes and some things we can do to, 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 um, to, for that is to create habitat by choosing natives most of the time planting in groups or islands of plants to provide habitat and cover food and nesting sites. Uh, if I tried to put in a collage all of the um, different connections that there are between plants and animals and soil, uh, you know, it'd be, it would be impossible to, to uh, you know, have a, a poster board that large, but just a few of them associated with an oak tree like this, uh, lots of interactions underground, um, and there are many species of insects and other arthropods, spiders, for example, that will be in the canopy of an oak tree that provide tremendous food resources uh, for birds, not to mention the acorns that certain other animals will take. Um, birds, even those that we think of as being seed eaters, trem uh, rely tremendously on, uh, on insects, to, especially to feed their young. There are more than 5,000 species of invertebrates that are associated with California oaks. So we need to um, try to uh, preserve and plant uh, trees as much as possible. Other benefits from plants, uh, are that um, not only do they provide bugs and bird, uh, bugs for the birds to eat, uh, but they also take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They use it to grow and they release carbon 
uh, uh, release oxygen, sorry, in its place. Uh, the carbon in their tissues makes its way down into the soil for long-term storage, which will help to alleviate our climate uh, crisis. Uh, plants are simply not optional uh, on this planet. Uh, not only do they provide oxygen, they are also basi the basis for, um, for the entire food web. Everything eats plants or eats things that eats plants. So um, you've seen this kind of um, diagram before, and we've come to understand that uh, the great majority of structure, fire, fire, structure fires during wildfire events come from uh, embers floating in from the, the fire front and the wildfire. And so using that information uh, helps us to design and think about um, you know, the maintenance and the, the creation of a home landscape for improved safety. This is also a diagram that you're going to be familiar with um, that suggests the appropriate spacing between plants. And you can see how this would lead many homeowners to believe that we must have isolated plants with this sort of distance, with these distance guidelines between them. So we get this checkerboard effect of isolated plants that sit maybe eight or 10 feet uh, from each other, um, not realizing that this can be applied to clusters of plants or islands of plants, which we can do. And so this has been redrawn by Ellie to show these islands of plants with the appropriate spacing between them based on the sort of the, the, the maximum height of a plant in that cluster. Another difference between the two diagrams um, would be that this one kind of suggests a bare, you know, a bare soil or gives the idea that it needs to be this moonscape of, uh, of, of rock. Um, it is important to keep the soil covered. Rock is not um, the ideal um, material for that, except for close to the house, where in this you know, sort of zone zero near the house, it is the most appropriate mulch. But elsewhere, we want to think of plants covering the soil. We want to think of an organic mulch, uh, again, where that's appropriate and at the, the right kind of depth, the right kind of material. Vertical spacing, um, another, you know, uh, concept that you're very familiar with, but we want to emphasize the importance of, of yes, having plants um, in the landscape, including under trees, but just being very careful of this uh, spacing guideline uh, of having three times the space, three times the height of the, uh, uh, of the lower understory um, shrub or ground cover in space up to the canopy. Um, but that kind of plant coverage uh, is important and very beneficial from a, a habitat point of view. Here is a, a vertical space or ladder fuel removal uh, project um, at uh, photos from Ellie and, and from a project that took place at her, um, at her place where juniper shrubs, large juniper shrubs were removed from around the base of this oak tree. Um, this is the before and an after photo here. Uh, they're also reduced in height um, so that there could be that kind of vertical spacing that is appropriate between the junipers. Uh, this preserves some habitat for the quail that, um, that use this for cover, possibly for nesting underneath. And so this is part of a phased program to introduce native plants into this um, sort of a hedgerow strip along the fence line uh, while gradually removing junipers. New plants will be coming in um, with, you know, respectful of uh, vertical spacing, but replacing uh, a non-native with natives over time. Uh, also, this project involved clearing out uh, dead wood in the juniper. Uh, often, they a characteristic of their growth is that they they have their live tissues mostly out, out on the edge, and that shades and in, um, the interior and creates a lot of opportunity for for, uh, for uh, branches to die uh, in the middle. Uh, we think of, and you probably think of too, defensible space being thought of in zones, having a zone zero um, within five feet of structures a zone one, five to 30 feet, um, where we think of uh, clusters of plants, but with really defined um, sort of breaks between them to stop the, the progress of fire. Zone two is farther out, 30 to 100 feet from structures. Um, and you know some of those rules can be relaxed somewhat to allow for a little bit larger islands of plants, a little bit larger plants. Um, and we do encourage homeowners to think of the neighbors and work with them as it's very often the case that the zone two, for example, of one person's house falls within zone one uh, of the neighbors. So um, those first slides about uh, horizontal and vertical spacing apply throughout the landscape um, uh, where plants are, are, are appropriate. Um, and so we're handled together at the front end of this. Now we'll go zone by zone here and look at uh, very briefly the guidelines, but mostly some examples. So this zone zero, again, zero to five feet from the structure, generally is not a place for many plants um, and we like to show homeowners some options for attractive uses of this zone. 
Um, one of them can be using it as a walkway, as is shown very creatively here with some cobbles and some pavers um, with the plants moved away from the foundation. And I like to think with homeowners about how the sort of combination of goals here works very nicely together of removing a lawn, which is probably the reason that we had foundation plantings in the first place, is they kind of created this backdrop for, for the lawn. When the lawn is removed, which it really should be considered, uh, which should be considered because there's a lot of sustainability issues uh, with lawns, once that's removed and that becomes the prime place, the focal point in the landscape, but it also has this benefit of moving the vegetation away from the house, um, which is really a, you know, a, a real principle of uh, defense, defensible space design. Some other ideas for this zone zero. Um, if a sort of formal walking space isn't needed, it can be sort of a swath of gravel. And whoops, I'm sorry. Um, and this might you know, lower the costs uh, for folks. There's a uh, gravel and other materials come at a wide range of prices. Um, but, but this one just has this, um, allows for a vegetation free zone here. And you can see how this also moving that, uh, the plantings away from the house itself really makes them something that are visible from the windows. So you kind of have a two facing uh, landscape, one towards the, the folks inside the house looking out the windows and another towards say the street uh, and that view. There are some opportunities that we believe to use plants closer to the house, depending on the risk factors of the, of the community and the, the, the broader landscape and also the hardening of the house um, with siding that is non-flammable like this kind of cement board siding um, you know, you might be able to have some limited shrubs here. This is a ribes, a native, a California native uh, current plant. It can be kept thinned, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about pruning in a moment, um, thinned such that the vegetation stays away from the, um, from the house itself. Um, the, uh, the other plants here are herbaceous perennials. This is a hookara or coral bells. Um, and together they make a very nice combination for an area that probably has some afternoon shade. Uh, this ground cover in the middle photo is Daimondia. It is not a native and it's about the only non-native that probably will show up in this, uh, in this slideshow. It's a plant I use a fair amount at my own house as well as it's just very, very tidy. Um, it doesn't require a lot of water. It can take some, um, some uh, it, can, it can be walked upon. Uh, it is so close to the ground, it doesn't, it really cannot collect like dried leaves and other materials like that. So very well behaved in that sense, very low growing, hugging the ground. Um, some other examples from zone, or now actually, this zone, we'll talk about zone one. Now we're moving out five to 30 feet from structures. And here the main concept is planting in islands of plants or groups of clusters of plants separated by these non-flammable pathways. Um, so these groupings of plants will do so much more to create uh, habitat for, um, for wildlife. You think of you know, a, a quail or a hummingbird you know, seeking shelter, uh, hiding from that cat, uh, fe lizards, fence lizards, salamanders, things like that, all will benefit so much more from a cluster of plants than from a single isolated plant, especially if that plant is something like a, a succulent, an aloe or an agave or something like that that really doesn't you know, provide a lot of uh, cover opportunities. So here in this photo, we see this nice flagstone path. Um, the clusters of plants are going to include, I see the yellow flower here of a monkey flower. This gray plant is probably one of the mini sage uh, plants. I might call it salvia as well. Um, I see on this side, a California buckwheat, it looks like one of our native grasses. Um, I'll name off a lot of plants, um, probably more than you know, can easily be absorbed. I'll remind you that our website is sonomaresilientlandscapes.com, where also there's discussion of these very same plants uh, and also links to other organizations like the California Native Plant Society with lots of great information on using natives as landscape plants. The bottom photo shows a, um, a sort of a lawn effect, but it's created not from a grass um, and certainly not from a traditional uh, sod or lawn grass, but this is actually a sedge, so a grass relative, uh, a native sedge called Carex uh, cragracillus, clustered field sedge, I believe is its common name. It can be, it's the same in, in both the top and, and bottom of this terrace, uh, unmowed here and mowed uh, like a traditional lawn. Its benefits are that it can stay well uh, hydrated with much less water than a traditional lawn. Um, this top, um, the unmowed uh, look here is just beautiful. It looks like sort of flowing water. Um, and I'll note too that this vertical wall here it creates also something of a fire break depending on what the, the plant materials are uh, above and below. Um, and then as I was preparing for this presentation, I noted that um, 
the Delta, oh, it's a, uh, one of our major um, sod uh, uh, producers in our area uh, offers now, I think like five different um, either species or blends that are California natives to use as, uh, as sods for a, uh, an untraditional lawn material. Uh, this is California um, bench grass, um, uh, native bent grass lawn. There's also a water feature that you just see here that kind of is the focal point of this part of, uh, of the zone one. A uh, strip of gravel here creates the zone zero for this landscape. Uh, and here you'll see this you know, idea a number of times, different path materials. Um, and, and sometimes if the topography um, you know, suggests it, some stone walls to create these breaks between islands. Um, in this photo, I'm seeing California fuchsia. I see some sage, I believe, back here. Um, I'll note here, because it's mentioned in the description, that uh, arbor mulch or a wood chip uh, mulch to around two or three inches is recommended under the plants. It's what plants generally are, are used to, unless they're uh, desert plants. Um, and so they'll benefit. The root system benefits from that, um, from the cooling of the soil, the conservation of moisture, that interaction between the life in the soil, earthworms and fungi and so forth, and the organic material that it can, um, that it can decompose. So we like to see wood mulch under plants away from the, the zone zero, zero to five foot area with a non-combustible um, material for the pathways in, in zone one. Um, gorilla hair, that very, very fine stringy material as you're probably well aware is, um, is not appropriate anywhere. Uh, a couple more examples from uh, zone one. It doesn't have to always be a pathway. We don't always need uh, pathways everywhere through the garden. Uh, dry stream type features um, are a good solution as well. This combination of different sizes of gravel and cobble and some boulders that work well together give a really nice um, natural uh, look to a landscape that I very much like. I see some salvias here, probably some California asters and some native grasses as well. This is, um, and these photos, as you can see, in design are from um, April Owens, and so she'll have opportunity to speak to them as well during our, our discussion at the end. Uh, another feature can be um, a sort of a bioswale or rain garden, sometimes it's caused a depression that's created, landscaped with uh, rock and, and, and plant materials. These are intended not to be a pond year round by any means, but they hold water during rain events and maybe for a, a couple of days afterwards. Um, what they do is capture rain uh, storm water that falls on the property. We can direct water from, uh, from the roof to these uh, types of uh, rain gardens to allow the water to, um, to enter the soil, infiltrate into the soil there rather than being lost to the nearest uh, you know, creek or stream, um, which are already are you know, uh, usually overwhelmed with water just because of all of the other pavements that we have in our, in our neighborhoods. Uh, this landscape also features a gravel path with some vertical stone walls creating sort of terraces down a slope they create these you know, relatively narrow strips that can be um, utilized with, in, in this case, some fruit trees, but also some native plants like, uh, uh, like this uh, salvia, uh, local native Sonoma sage. I've uh, got a couple of quick videos here. This one, before I start it, because it only runs for four seconds, so it moves pretty quickly. Um, so before it starts, I'll just point out that uh, here we've got this flagstone path separating um, the houses just to the right, as you'll see as the, as the view pans. Uh, and separating from this uh, hillside uh, with plantings of, of native plants. These California poppies are an a, a, a native natural, a native uh, annual plant. They, this photo was just taken a couple of weeks ago. They are now going to seed and can be um, removed at about this time. There will be some seed that falls to the ground and that will germinate with the new winter rain. So this is something that really has its life cycle within the winter and spring months um, can be removed. Um, pretty much any time now, and um, so it removes it from the, the landscape as we go into the summer and fall fire season. Uh, let me hit play here and see how this goes. I'll stop it here to uh, point out that it's got, kind of almost missed it, um, uh, an area here without planting around the, uh, along the foundation of the house. Now, um, and it's a good probably 10 feet or so of distance, there's rock on the ground um, close to the house, then it transitions into a wood mulch that you kind of see here. The planting in this island uh, appears to me to be mostly sages and um, a dwarf form of coyote bush, which you're beginning to see here on the right side. Uh, this coyote bush only gets to, this is a, a dwarf form that will never get more than, um, you know, say two or three feet tall. It's not the eight or 10 foot um, sort of wild type coyote bush uh, seen in the chaparral areas. The sage can be cut down uh, every winter if desired, and that allows a, a fresh, 
um, removes a lot of the woodiness and allows a new sort of succulent growth um, to come up through the spring and summer months. The coyote bush to some degree can be handled that way as well, but it's um, probably better done, uh, you know, on a more like a two or three year cycle rather than every year. Let's finish playing that out. Oops. Again. Okay, there's the next slide. Um, this one shows, I see in the foreground here, a gray rush. This is another grass-like plant. Um, it's a very tidy in the landscape. It's not something that spreads. Um, and so is, is uh, easily kept to, to a smaller space. Behind it is probably, I'm guessing, a penstemon um, species in full bloom here, very attractive to many pollinators and um, hummingbirds and so forth. Um, behind it will be a larger uh, sage plant out, out towards that parking area. And let me play this. And we'll see a nice flagstone area. Hit pause here. So as we come towards the house, we're seeing a, a small island and there is a good distance between the porch. It's hard to tell from the perspective, but between the porch and this, this island planting, there's a, a good distance of five or six feet at least. Uh, I believe there's probably more penstemon here and we'll get into, uh, I believe some coral bells uh, and, and sage towards that end of the, uh, of the island as we get down there. Okay, and moving on then out to zone two, now we're 30 to 100 feet from structures. And so this allows us to, to uh, loosen a little bit our restrictions on the sizing of, uh, of the plants and of the, uh, the groupings of plants, but we still wanna be very conscientious of horizontal and vertical spacing um, in this area. As I say, some larger plants are possible. Um, pathways will still separate planting areas, but they can also have, we believe, a, a wood mulch uh, on the ground in this area. Again, nothing really, really fine, nothing really, really deep, um, but, um, but we don't need to separate everything out in this zone with these non-flammable um, materials of stone and gravel and so forth. Some examples uh, out here in this sort of zone two area. Um, here, this is a, a longish uh, island um, sort of defined on one side by a driveway, by the uh, street. On the other side, I see in the background probably a toyon, some manzanita, uh, one of the salvias. This is a, a coffee berry here in the, on the right side. This we saw a couple of weeks ago in full bloom and just covered literally with thousands of, um, of uh, insects visiting um, the, the flower for the nectar resources. So again, those are um, you know, that's food for wildlife as well, for the uh, for lizards, for birds, um, a critical step as we go from the energy produced by plants to the, uh, to the, the, the trophic levels, the, the food web farther, uh, farther on down. Um, as this uh, landscape develops, the trees will need to be limbed up and, or, the, or the plants um, uh, pruned down, um, possibly some, you know, removed if the case uh, suggests it so that there's appropriate vertical spacing with some of these uh, young trees. Uh, as they grow. The landscape on the right shows uh, one of the native grasses. Grasses are, are great complements to landscapes just to give a different color and texture. Um, to the garden, uh, this is tufted hair grass. I see farther on down some California fuchsia, this gray green uh, plant that will very soon be just covered in, uh, in flowers and some sages as, as well are in this landscape. So again, what to use between the islands of plants, really wanting to focus on this, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, not sure how that happened. Okay, maybe some little preview. Uh, what to use between the islands of plants, arbor mulch is appropriate um, between islands from 30 feet on out. Um, again, we would like to use an arbor mulch or wood chip mulch under the plants within the five to 30 foot zone um, but breaking up those islands of plants with, um, with non-flammable materials. Irrigated native grasses could go in all zones, gravel or stone pathways, swales, other features that use these materials are appropriate in all zones. Um, just a quick word or a few words about, um, about maintenance, uh, and in this case, pruning. So here we have a little discussion of hedging versus thinning. So much of our landscapes now are being uh, managed by Hedging is something that's quick, is something that's easy. People don't have to think a lot about it. Um, and we find all of our plants being turned into you know, balls and squares, um, you know, the hedges that have the flat tops, uh, that sort of thing. 
Um, you know, I question the aesthetics of it personally. If I'm if I want to look at you know, circles and squares, I have lots of opportunity and you know to do that in the typical house and household. Um, I like plants that look like plants um, personally, but there's also I would argue some fire uh, reasons to avoid hedging. Um, and when you cut a plant, as is shown here in this close up of a barberry, uh, from near that point you get a, a profusion of new growth, um, and then when you cut that again with the next round of hedging. It splits again, so you get this exponential division uh, of the branching, which results in a lot of very fine twiggy material. Of course, as you're cutting it, a lot of that you're not going to be able to remove um, by raking or blowing or whatever. A lot of it's going to fall into the plant, and you tend to, you know, get some accumulations of um, of debris in the in the center of the plant that can lead to some you know, fire issues. Uh, versus uh, more of a thinning approach to pruning, where we're removing whole stems from the center of the plant rather than cutting around the top surface. Uh, this is an, a western redbud um, tree or large shrub. It grows more as a shrubby plant typically, um, but a large shrub to, to 10 or 12 feet in height. This is in my own yard. So as it has grown, I have removed lower branches, selected the, the ones I would like to keep as a permanent multi trunks to the plant. This spring, I removed this, um, these couple of branches off to the side and continue to limit up um, a bit. So I want some distance between the ground cover under it um, and the canopy above. Uh, it also is often very beautiful, not maybe so much with this Western red bud, but of course many of the manzanita plants and others have just you know, some gorgeous bark and sort of architecture to the, um, to the branching that it's really good to, really nice to expose. Um, just in a drawing, this is a, a diagram. We're not really necessarily training the tree um, you know, from the start, there is some element of that, but it's largely removing um, you know, some of the uh, interior branches to accomplish that goal. Now, the timing of vegetation management is very, very important. Um, su substantial vegetation thinning should be done in the fall and very early winter months because bird nesting season is in the spring and the summer. So basically from March through August, there is the, the, the likelihood of bird nesting in um, in our plants. And so, you know, significant vegetation removal really should be done in September to February. We want to be aware of birds that are nesting on the ground as well, not just look up and, and into the canopy of large shrubs and trees, um, but around the ground as well. I want to remember that we share this space with other life. Not only do we share it, but we depend on them and, and they depend on us. It, it goes both ways. Um, some people are, have concerns about uh, some of our wildland native plants like this manzanita. I know, of, you know for example, HOAs that have manzanita on their do not plant uh, lists, at least as a you know, sort of a shrubby form. But I think of this situation where we have a non-native back here, I'm not positive what it is, possibly Westringia, um, you know, it's quite possible that it would show up on a, a firewise plant list, but grown as it is, kind of over large. Um, but even hedged from its, you know, to keep it lower than it, what would be its maximum uh, height, right against a tree. We are not sure of the vertical spacing there because we can't see it in the photograph, but very likely, um, you know, poses something of a ladder fuel risk versus this, um, you know, sort of well-behaved um, manzanita, probably the variety Howard McMinn, um, which has, you know, either had some thinning or grew this way naturally. It could probably have a little bit more thinning if it was you know, felt that that would be, make it a little bit more comfortable. Um, a ground cover that's quite low around it, um, you know, with a, a non-flammable material nearby, this kind of suggests to me a better situation than the one in the back. And so some of these native um, uh, shrubby species that are fire adapted are not necessarily inappropriate in a fire-wise landscape. Uh, we do not talk about a fire-wise plant list. Um, because all plants will burn, of course, um, and we much prefer to think about um, the right plant in the right place. So putting it in the right situation, thinking of the right plate, a plant that is not going to be overly large um, uh, or an inter inappropriately placed. So thinking about how it will grow, how, how large, what maintenance it, uh, it will require, and whether it is an invasive plant. Uh, with this notion of um, mostly using lower plants in the zone one in particular, and that's often where there has been a lawn. Again, we have this nice um, combination of possibly removing lawn, moving plants out a little bit farther into that space and think of some very um, you know, appropriately sized plants that are mostly herbaceous, like for example, uh, yarrow, this white flower here, 
Again, very attractive to uh, butterflies and pollinators. Monkey flowers now are in many colors. These are hybrids, um, oftentimes, of some of our native uh, monkey flower species. Um, this might get to you know, as much as uh, three feet tall or so, and so that, you know, that height needs to be kept in mind. Uh, some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, California asters uh, are lower growing, very tidy um, in that respect. And this is, a, even though it's called Idaho fescue, a fescue that is also native to California, um, a very blue form. But this is a super tidy clump of grass, no bigger than about one foot all the way around. Uh, the bottom left shows, again, another California buckwheat. There are many species of these, um, including a number in the, in the horticultural trade. This is one that can get um, develop some woodiness to it, but it responds very well to cutting it low in the winter, um, either every year or, or at least um, every few years. Uh, this next slide shows an example of that, not with California buckwheat. This is another, um, another species that I would like to um, describe and promote. This is coyote mint, Monardella velosa. Uh, this is a perennial to about a, a two feet tall, three feet wide. Does very well in full sun um, with very low moisture requirements. This is truly a mint um, uh, in the mint family. Um, so it has that lovely scent. The flowers are these purple blossoms all summer long. It has just started now. Uh, all of these plants um, are the, are, all of the photos are of the same plant in my front yard. So in the fall, it is looking a little bit ratty, honestly. Um, the flowers have, have died. It's gotten kind of woody. Um, so I cut that back in the winter. It looks like this. Really, you can't hardly see anything, but I cut them back to stubs of just two, four, two or four inches or so. And then in the spring, this photo taken probably three weeks ago, um, lots of lush new growth. So it's removed most of that woodiness. And uh, right about now, it's just starting to bloom. And again, this is the same plant, but last summer, um, showing another of the California buckwheats in yellow um, back in the back. This is very attractive to um, many butterflies and other pollinators. Um, with that, I will close. I will thank you and again, encourage uh, questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, John, appreciate it. Um, and that was a, probably a lot of new information for the fire officials, so, but really thought out, well presented. Um, I don't Roberta, think, could, yeah. could I, I, I wondered if I could share my screen because we have a, a handout and, and you know, go ahead and, but just keep in mind, I just wanna show this um, handout and we don't currently have it on our website, but I think we could get it up by the end of the okay. day. Definitely. So when you're ready. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen while I chat okay. with these guys. So um, I'm a little disappointed with the lack of questions in the chat, you guys. Um, however, this is um, the first time we've delivered this module. We're doing several modules for various audiences with this material. And so this is our first opportunity to present it to the fire officials or fire inspectors. So I have an ask for you guys. Um, if you see anything in here that was particularly valuable to you, please let us know. And if you can give us some ideas on what your thoughts are about this material, that would be much appreciated. Uh -huh. Because your feedback will help us massage this material as we evolve and make adjustments to it and you know put it out again and again and again. Uh, to Sonoma County fire officials and others outside of Sonoma County even. So if you guys could do that, be much appreciated. And Mason's going to drop our fire station Sonoma's contact information in the chat. Um, and also, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that for now. I'll turn it over to Ellie so she can explain this um, threefold uh, brochure that, that we've been working on. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we could drop there is a, the it's Sonoma resilient landscapes.com <clears throat> in the in the chat as well. So yeah, we've been we've been tabling. Um, we've gone to Oakmont, we were at the Cloverdale um, fire firewise one and the Santa Rosa one last weekend. And so we created this as just a really quick handout for people to get, you know, become more familiar with our work. And we also wanted to offer it for um, lands or fire inspectors to be taking it and handing it out to people when they go out and do their inspections. And um, and Paul, I can 
I can offer that to you and, and ask if, you know, if that seems like a good idea, first of all, um, because I, I think people really are hungry for this kind of information. If Paul's still here. Paul had to actually, Paul had to jump off. Okay. Yeah. Right. But I don't, uh, I, I don't see as far as the FPOs go, um, unless Devin wants to chime in, I don't see there being an issue with us getting some of these and seeing how that would work for our inspectors to have them on them when they're out doing inspections. Perfect. Good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the only thing that I could see would be that um, districts uh, or agencies are going to want something branded with their logo, uh, things coming from the department. So you might want to um, consider that if, if that would be something you'd be open to, um, because a lot of folks try to send out their own district branding and, and logo branding and stuff. Um, but I think it's a good a good start with some great material. Devin, what if we rework the graphic to leave like a placeholder for the local um, logo? Yeah, that or we could even possibly use the county fire chief's logo, which is what we've adopted for the oh. FPOs and, yeah. and do that. So that could be a possibility. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Absolutely. Okay. So what, to get from here to there, though, what I'd like to do is just have this put in front of the FPO group um, and you guys agendize it and say, hey, we like this. Um, I, I'd, I'd kind of really appreciate a formal um, handshake before we print a bunch with the with the chief's logo on it. I don't think it'll be an issue, but I, I really would like to do that. Yeah, we don't have a regularly scheduled meeting until uh, July at this point. So that's something we can do and, and look at putting that on the agenda for July. Okay, fantastic. So I think that's two items I have on the July agenda. <laughs> All right, well, let's, if we can do that, that would be awesome. Thank you, Devin. No problem. Um, so I I don't have my chat up anymore. Mason, are there, can you field any questions in the chat? And while he's taking a look, I, I gotta let you guys know, you guys know, many of you know me, so um, you know I tend to forget things. So with that said, I, I was remiss in not calling attention to Mason Innumerable earlier during the introductions. Mason's working behind the scenes, making stuff like this happen for Fire Safe Sonoma, and he's our Grizzly Corps fellow. Um, he's, he's been with us for several months now doing an outstanding job for Fire Safe Sonoma. So um, kudos to Mason for your help. And I apologize for not um, mentioning you on the front end. No worries, Roberta. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, now just scanning the chat. We just did get a question from uh, Raymond. Um, Hedging versus trimming. Does trimming take considerably more time than hedging? That's an Ellie or John question. Yeah, I'll start. And, and, and Ellie's um, and April's as well. Um, thoughts are also very welcome. I mean, I guess I think if you had a lot of shrubs that you had to hedge or you had the option of trimming, of um, thinning them, um, then yes, I think the trimming would take longer, but you know, it's sort of you don't need to do the hedging um, and the thinning is only done. So the hedging is, you know, would be typically done every, you know, possibly as much as every couple of weeks, depending on the landscape service. It's not a, like a once a year kind of a thing where the thinning that I'm talking about is, you know, done periodically, you know, maybe once a year or something for a given shrub. And it might be done in, at different times of the different seasons of the year, depending on the species and things like that. But it's not something that you're going back and doing uh, week after week after week, um, hedging is often treated is often done kind of like mowing a lawn. It's you know really close intervals. Other thoughts? Yeah, I just mentioned that a lot of times hedging is required or some some form of you know cutting the plant back because you put the wrong plant there. You know it's yeah. just too big space, and and so we're emphasizing lower growing plants in the the in zone one the five to thirty. Um, so there's, and, and maybe only one or two appropriately sized shrubs that, that get slightly bigger, and then you just don't need to hedge, you know, or, or in that case, you wouldn't hedge at all, and you just go in and prune and, and, and open it up a little bit so that it's less of a potential fire hazard. Hey, Ellie, can you do me a favor and turn off screen share now that we're in the discussion mode? Yep. Thanks. And I just would add, you know, like what Ellie was starting to talk about is like the right plant, like John talked about the right plant in the right place. And also educating 
I know that you all are fire inspectors, but like the clients and, and the homeowners need to educate their landscape professionals um, to not come in and do this. So I think this is a big issue with, you know, landscaping companies come in and hedge and then you're always hedging and you're building up all that fire um, unsafe shrub material. And so it's really about, you know, that whole communication going throughout the, the system of your garden. All right. Thanks, April. Appreciate that. There are no more questions. I'm, I'm These sorry to say that John and I already. they know the Latin words and everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we didn't. I think that was wonderful. Let's just start showing you all uh, photos and everything. But please reach out and for more education around this. Yeah, I put my email in the chat. If anybody has questions afterwards, please, um, please let me know. Yeah, and then you guys probably already have Fire Station Alma's contact information. You can certainly reach reach us through Paul, Chief Lowenthal, or talk to him directly. He's on our board, but we really, really, really need your feedback to, to make the improvements we need to make this work for you guys as a target audience. Um, this is a tough one for us because the other audiences we have, you know, our homeowners and, and maintenance contractors and landscape architects and designers and, you know, those folks, I think for the, for the um, coalition, that's a little bit easier audience to target the message to and craft the message for, but for you guys, this is a little tough. It's like, okay, what, you know, what can we share with you guys that you'll grab really quick and run with and learn? And what do you feel comfortable with in terms of, you know, the, the breaking of the groups and the paths between, et cetera. Um, so that's that's where we need your help to, to keep us pointing in the right direction. I think the uh, the overall, the training and the information that's provided was a lot of information in a short amount of time. And I appreciate the um, kind of the brevity of it um, to keep us on task and, and to not have it go prolonged when we're out doing defensible space inspections though a lot of times you know we are just looking for those zones and it, it kind of doing that brief education with the homeowner but we're not necessarily right we're not in the plant business we're not into the gardening business and so we're not going to get down into the nitty-gritty of it on what we recommend and things like that so having that brochure that trifold i think that's a great idea that's a great start um, to hand that out and then that it guides them to you folks who are the real experts in the landscaping and the gardening. Um, that's not our wheelhouse, right? Our wheelhouse is to make sure that the structures are hardened to the best that they can and, and that, you know, they're, they're maintaining their yards and whatnot, but um, you know, we're not giving them advice on, on how to landscape where that's where you folks come in on, on those suggestions. So I think that trifold's a great start for that. I see a hand up. It looks like Trevor Smith and Gary. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to call on him. Uh, Fire Marshal Smith and Captain Johnson. I'm um, not sure which of you are asking the question. Maybe both of you. Go ahead. I, this is Trevor. I just want to make a general statement. I appreciate the information and, and we're, we're understanding of what that is. But my biggest concern with presenting additional information to the community is that some of the messaging is not in alignment with other messaging. For example, CAL FIRE's new wildfire mitigation unit, they're talking about the insurance group's uh, new program, Wildfire Prepared Home, as an example. And their information, when you look at it, is um, a lot different than this messaging. Um, some of the pictures in the presentation today didn't necessarily articulate fully what was necessary, from a mitigation standpoint, while the pictures show exactly what would be acceptable, and we appreciate that, and, and we want biodiverse landscapes in our community, and we understand the benefits of that. Oftentimes in the messaging that we present to the community is taken with a black and white nature. They look at it, they say, oh, that's acceptable, and, and they don't really dig into the weeds again. Um, as to what it really means to have defensible space. So from a fire side, um, I know that we definitely try to present information that's not open to a lot of interpretation and our best opportunity to communicate some of the nuances is when we're on site. So I, I would like the um, handout that was presented today. Uh, it would be a great resource for us to have 
And I look forward to the FPO group evaluating that and you know, formally accepting that as a document that we'd be willing to share. But our website and other information to include CAL FIRE's new information, the IBHS new information, and more importantly, the implementation of Assembly Bill, excuse me, Assembly Bill 3074, which is starting January 1st of 2023 and retroactively for many of the properties in our community, January 1st, 2024, has really hard language in it, um, up to and including all plants burn and very specific, we need to make a change type of language. So I just want, from a communication standpoint with our customers, I want to be able to provide the best information possible and avoid as much confusion as possible. Hopefully that made sense. And my intent is not my intent is not to say what we're doing here today is wrong. I appreciate it, and and we appreciate that on our inspection. So thank you. Yeah, our markets, yeah. That's exactly the kind of feedback we're looking for. Um, exactly that. So we'll go back and we'll compare this material with what you know what's being presented by Calpers because what you know one of FireSafe Sonoma's things that we try to trumpet is consistent messaging. So if there's conflicting messaging out there, that's an area we're going to have to work on to try to to try to uh, make sure that our messaging is consistent. And it might be something to the degree of uh, qualifying where we're speaking about when we speak about these landscapes. So if you're in a very high fire severity zone, zero to five, pretty much hardscape, you know, as as the world turns. Um, but then other areas maybe not. Just you know, so but yeah, we definitely we need we need to explore that further. Thank you for that. Okay. Ellie, have your hand um, raised. Oh Thanks. yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I I really appreciate that comment. And um, you're um, Trevor, you're in Sonoma Valley, right? And Sonoma Ecology Center is there, and it's possible that we might be able to. You know, get together with you or do a Zoom meeting or something, and and dig in a little bit more to how you said that the the new fire insurance and Cal Fire, um, uh, you know, approaches are different from what what we offered. And I think it would be good to know if you if you could be more specific about that. Not necessarily today, but if we could hear a little bit more about that, I, you know, I'd like to sort of invite you to give us a little bit more feedback. Is that something you'd be available? Yeah, we would be more than willing to communicate and talk about the different ideas and uh, yeah. see how we can kind of get our messaging in alignment with one another. If you send me an email, we can set up a time to do that. We'd appreciate I, that. I, I would actually like to take that a step further since you guys are here in the room. Would it, um, and Devin, maybe you can now or, um, kind of correct me if I'm wrong or help with this or whatever. But um, would it be a good idea to maybe create a, an FPO subcommittee to kind of work on this with us to kind of make it work together? Kind of like we, what we've done before with tents and other things, you know, we, we come up with a group to kind of get everyone on the same page. I think that might be worthwhile if we can do that. Any thoughts on that? Um, any of you guys, or particularly Devin, if you want to lead that, uh, the follow-up discussion? I mean, that could be something that falls under your fire safe Sonoma update uh, liaison update that you provide. Um, again, we don't have a regularly scheduled meeting until July. Um, so it's it's hard to kind of get the ball rolling. I think the good first step would be, you know, maybe meeting with Trevor and and, uh, you know, finding a local counterpart through Cal Fire um, and, and working with them um, and then going from there. But like I said, I, I think we have a lot of committees right now. So just maybe as as a, just a report from when you do your normal liaison, I think that would be appropriate. I'd like to suggest Chief Connect um, because I, I, um, I think he might be most, he might be interested just in the fire inspector training with Cal Fire. Um, I, I would rather we approach Chief or Marshall Turboville first um actually Great. Um, and Great. then if he isn't able to carve out the time my suggestion would be we reach out to chief ben nichols to see if maybe he can suggest somebody from the unit that would have the the skill set to help with us in this endeavor okay all right well it's um about five minutes till 
Uh, Mason, double check any questions in the chat. And I think we're uh, all good there. <clears throat> Roberta, quick question. Um, and Devin, what's the best way to follow up? And, and Trevor, what's the best way to follow up with you? Or are you saying that we should, instead of in, in working individually, we should do more of a committee approach, including Cal Fire and Roberta? Should we should we should we set up a Zoom meeting with you know like multiple? I think the next step or action item at this point would be um, to see if Trevor wants to champion this. Uh, but maybe Trevor, you can reach out to to Chief Nichols, um, maybe suggest uh, Turboville to to be on this group. Would you mind doing that um, and, and getting the ball pushed in that way? My sense is that if the ask comes from a fire official, it's more likely to get eyeballs on it from Cal Fire and other fire officials. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so old now that um, my name recognition isn't what it used to be. Uh, and so uh, if you could help with that, Trevor, that would, uh, I think, could add some horsepower to what we're trying to do. Yeah, I'd be willing to, to facilitate that conversation. Um, I'd like to meet with Sonoma Ecology Center and Ellie and yeah. anyone that's involved to kind of go over some of my concerns and um, and where I think there's some opportunities to make a couple changes. And, you know, the messaging is great for someone who understands plant life and, and what a plant's going to do next. And it's just that lay person that sees a picture and makes a decision. And those are the people that we want to try to capture some of that. That's my biggest concern. But um, I think after talking with the Ecology Center and sharing my opinions and ideas that we could facilitate that conversation. Horrible time of year to do that uh, because everyone's going to get super busy right now on the Cal Fire side of things and the fire prevention side of things. But I think we can still make something happen. So um ellie if you want to reach out to me and we'll set up a you know 30 minutes an hour to sit down and talk about ideas and then we'll go from there okay you, you may hear from john and me yeah perfect anyone who wants anyone who wants to be involved sure that would be great trevor thank you You're welcome. That, that sounds like a good first step so um uh fire marshal smith much appreciated if you can connect with the Ecology Center and get that ball rolling. And then we'll just go from there. Uh, we'll grow out of that, out of those discussions. Does that work for everybody? Uh, particularly Fire Marshal Smith and Ellie and John? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should be calling you Fire Marshal Smith. My, my, my apologies in this official setting. Yeah, Trevor's fine. <laughs> I'm just weird that way. <laughs> All right, okay, you guys. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I have to jump off. Um, right at three, a couple of minutes still. So if if um, any last words, John or April or anybody um, before we jump off? Thank you for the opportunity. It was great. Perfect. Thank you, John. Great presentation. And thanks for everybody joining. Thank you. You know, I just I want to say really quickly, we we got into depth with the plants because when I talked to, to um, Paul Lowenthal, he was like, I think they want to know more about plants because people keep asking for like plant lists. So I think we, we probably went into more depth with plants than we would have normally um, because, <laughs> because of that one comment from Paul. So yeah, but we can do that now, you know. <laughs> All right. So good things in store as we evolve and move forward. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day. And I uh, appreciate, really appreciate your time here. And hopefully it was of some value to you. Um, it definitely was for us to be able to take the next step. So much appreciated. So, Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.